Uh, good morning. Hi, this is uh, Rob Sweet. I'm not sure if everyone can hear me, um, but uh, I, I have. <laughs> good morning, Tador. Uh, on behalf of the, on the behalf of the Division of uh, Healthcare Simulation Science here in the Department of Surgery. Uh, the University of Washington. It really gives me great pleasure and honor to be able to uh, introduce this morning's uh, Grand Round speaker, Dr. Teodor Grancharov, a friend and colleague from St. Michael's Hospital. Uh, uh, Teodor is a professor of surgery at the University of Toronto. Uh, he completed his general surgery at the University of Copenhagen and got his doctoral degree in medical sciences actually at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. Uh, and then he completed a fellowship in moon invasive surgery at Western Pennsylvania in Temple. Uh, he holds the Keenan Chair in Surgery, and uh, he's one of the outstanding researchers in the field of surgical education and technology. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, his super, uh, numerous leadership positions, the American College of Surgeons uh, and Sages, uh, his practice is really focused on foregut surgery, uh, including cancer and revisional bariatric surgery. Uh, Tador is going to uh, present a very exciting lecture this morning uh, about uh, the black box and its role in patient safety and surgery. Uh, Tador. Rob, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, inviting me uh, to share some of our experience. Uh, I, I've, uh, Seattle is one of the few places in the U.S. which uh, I haven't visited yet, so I was hoping this uh, Invitation will happen under different circumstances, but uh, hopefully I'll have the opportunity to uh, uh, to visit you uh, and uh, the team at U Washington um, when uh, uh, we return to uh, some some form for normal. Um, so um, um, again, thanks for everybody for joining uh, so early on this Wednesday morning. Um, I um, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, with uh, a disclosure. Uh, I uh, am uh, a founder of an academic startup here, Surgical Safety Technologies, which uh, commercializes the black box. So I have some conflict uh, uh, when uh, we discuss uh, uh, this uh, initiative. Uh, however, it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, I'll uh, try to uh, stay within uh, uh, the uh, uh, scientific uh, boundaries of, uh, of this project, which is a research initiative. Uh, and uh, hopefully it will remain like that. Uh, so uh, uh, we uh, have uh, worked uh, uh, with, uh, uh, in the area of uh, uh, simulation, education, uh, technology development uh, for uh, uh, a long time. Uh, our team here uh, at the International Center for Surgical Safety, which is part of St. Michael's Hospital's Research Institute, involves a truly multidisciplinary a group of individuals and, uh, and uh, investigators and scientists uh, from various uh, areas, uh, from art and design, uh, various aspects of engineering, uh, healthcare, research, data science, and uh, throughout the years, we've, we've learned a lot from throughout partnerships with, uh, with various uh, industry partners. Uh, and it really changed uh, the way we uh, identify uh, research questions and uh, how we solve research questions when we have such a diverse group uh, around the table. Uh, it, uh, we, uh, uh, it's, it is fascinating, and I'm sure many of you have worked in uh, such multidisciplinary environments. Uh, it is fascinating to see how uh, individuals from art and design uh, 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 with expertise in art and design address uh, research questions and, and engineers. Uh, and obviously a lot of things to learn for us as uh, surgeons and, uh, and uh, healthcare researchers. So this is a, an image of our research institute, uh, which is uh, downtown Toronto. St. Michael's is one of the uh, six major uh, hospitals affiliated with the uh, University of uh, Toronto. The, the interesting part or the symbolic part of this uh, image is the bridge here. You can see the bridge between our research institute and our clinical uh, facility, uh, which is really the reason uh, why I joined this uh, institution. Uh, it was uh, the, this uh, uh, commitment and ability to very quickly transfer uh, research knowledge into, into clinical practice, which is really the reason why uh, we do this research. And, uh, uh, and I would, uh, I don't know whether there are uh, some uh, residents or uh, uh, young researchers uh, 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 listening today, but uh, my advice to them is always, uh, 
look for this bridge uh, whenever you engage in healthcare research uh, because none of the 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 end goal of uh, of our work is not to uh, at another, another publication or presentation down the end goal of our work is to see how it impacts uh, the practice and the lives of uh, our colleagues and uh, and uh, most importantly our patients so uh, when we talk about uh, surgical safety and safety in general uh, we had some naive uh, views uh, and uh, uh, some still continue to share these naive views that if we uh, uh, educate and hire competent individuals and we invest in high quality training uh, and we create evidence-based uh, standard operating procedures and follow these procedures uh, and invest in modern uh, equipment uh, we will achieve uh, safety uh, which is uh, which is not the true we know that uh, in our daily practice there are many uh, unpredictable uh, events, uh, events that uh, we encounter uh, maybe once in a career or, or not, not, not that frequently. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the thing that uh, is, uh, has always been challenging is uh, that uh, we uh, lose the opportunity to learn the, from these events and to uh, share our experience with a very broad audience of our uh, colleagues and trainees. And probably this is one of the reasons why uh, healthcare or surgery hasn't achieved uh, this level of safety that, that we've seen in other high risk, uh, high performance industries. And I, and I promise I'm not gonna uh, speak too much about the analogies between aviation and uh, surgery. I know many of you are tired of these analogies. Obviously, uh, we're not pilots and our patients are not uh, aircraft, but there is a lot to learn uh, from uh, aviation industry, primarily in the area of safety culture and attitude. Uh, one of the one of the early things that I learned uh, through our and we collaborated throughout the years uh, very closely with uh, the uh, flight data analysis team at uh, Air Canada. Uh, one of the things that I I, I learned uh, early on was uh, the the presence in every uh, major modern aircraft of the, what they call the secondary black box, which is a device that captures, these are not the orange black boxes that all of us know about uh, that are opened whenever, whenever there is a crash, uh, but these are devices that acquire uh, enormous amount of information from every single flight. Uh, and what's impressive is how they've been able to learn from, from flights uh, that took off and landed normally without any accident. Uh, however, there were uh, some uh, near misses or events uh, of interest that could be used uh, to improve quality and safety. Air Canada has been capturing and maintaining a database of, uh, of uh, such flights of interests uh, for more than a decade. And it's impressive to see their, uh, uh, their, their present database that allows them to proactively predict and mitigate risk according to the route, according to the type of aircraft that they operate, according to the experience of the crew, uh, and so on, and, and, or, or the time of the day, time of the year. So, so this is the, the type of approach that I think we can learn a lot and inspired us a lot along the way when we were uh, developing and implementing uh, our uh, initiative that we call Operating on Black Box. So uh, I know that... Uh, I'm not going to go through all these uh, previous studies that have shown uh, that have shown uh, uh, how uh, many challenges and how uh, dangerous surgery may be. Uh, obviously, the uh, methodologies of these studies uh, can be questioned. I think the majority of us would agree, though, uh, that in our current practice, there are lots of things that uh, we can and we should do better. Uh, and in order to do that, we need high-quality uh, data uh, to. Uh, uh, to base our uh, interventions on. Uh, one of the major challenges uh, for us, uh, and I think everybody doing research around education and safety, is uh, uh, the fact that the operating room has, uh, still remains in one of the most secretive environments in modern society and one of the least under, uh, understood environments in, 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 uh, in healthcare. And uh, un unless we uh, uh, break that uh, uh, secrecy, uh, unless we uh, uh, embrace uh, openness and transparency, I think uh, it will be challenging to make some great groundbreaking uh, impact uh, in uh, uh, healthcare safety. Um, uh, we still rely on data primarily based on reporting and recall. Even the 
uh, the new fancy visualizations that are offered by many uh, providers are based on self-reported data that is not always accurate. Uh, we looked at, uh, a couple of years ago, we uh, conducted a study, looked at uh, uh, some near misses uh, and, uh, and adverse event associated with the use of various needle uh, 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 in laparoscopic surgery. And we, we compared uh, some of the data that we acquired with data that was reported in the patient chart or the electronic patient record. And we found that there was a significant discrepancy uh, between uh, uh, what was reported and what was observed. Uh, and uh, most importantly, uh, all of the uh, reports did not, uh, or uh, all the information in the electronic uh, patient record did not capture any of the information around the near misses. And the near miss is, uh, is a really fascinating, uh, 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 offers a fascinating uh, amount of information because not only indicates uh, the, the safety threats, uh, but also uh, demonstrates very clearly what how the team recognized it, uh, how they dealt with it, and how they ensured that despite the adverse event, uh, that didn't uh, progress into an adverse uh, outcome. So uh, it only not only captures the safety threats, but also captures uh, and identifies uh, resilience supports uh, within the team or the organization or the individual uh, to uh, still ensure good clinical outcomes. So we, uh, the near miss since, uh, since then became one of the central pieces of the, of the analysis that uh, the black box uh, focuses on. Um, so uh, we also looked at uh, the value of the modern morbidity and mortality meetings. I'm sure that uh, the, the M&Ms are conducted uh, Better in your institution, but uh, it's some. It's an event, uh, or it's uh, it, it, it's uh, it's uh, 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 what, what one of these uh, educational uh, experiences that has always bothered me because it uh, is uh, always based on recall. Uh, we often don't remember what happened a week or two weeks ago, uh, and the discussion always turns into a literature review or uh, some uh, uh, anecdotal. Uh, uh, sharing of information or past experience. So we looked here, uh, uh, we, we identified a number of uh, adverse events, both major and minor, and we asked at the end of the uh, surgical procedure for the entire team uh, to report uh, whether uh, they identified any uh, adverse event, and there was significant amount of adverse events that were missed uh, and not reported at the end of the procedure. A, a week later, uh, the, 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 uh, our findings uh, confirmed that uh, neither the surgeon nor the fellow nor the resident remembered accurately, was able to classify uh, the uh, intraoperative adverse events. So there is no doubt that there is a significant uh, uh, loss of information that uh, uh, is currently uh, happening in, in our clinical practice. And in order to uh, fully utilize uh, the value of this uh, 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 or the, the learning uh, opportunity with adverse events and adverse outcomes, we need to capture the data in a more reliable fashion than we currently do. Um, and we can learn a lot from, uh, from other industries. So we can ask ourselves, how do other professionals improve? And uh, uh, we all know that now, not only professional athletes and professional teams, but even uh, uh, high school teams uh, have access to uh, video analysis uh, and uh, video coaching. Uh, there is there are opportunities to, to transform this large amount to transform the, this large amounts of unstructured data into structured data that could be used for uh, improving of performance and uh, it's fascinating to see how professional athletes video coaches uh, use this information to continuously improve we can't even imagine that uh, a professional athlete will continue to practice without uh, detailed uh, information and uh, and, and data around uh, their failures and successes. So when other uh, uh, professionals, uh, and not only uh, athletes, but other high, high uh, performance industries have used uh, uh, analysis uh, and video analysis for their uh, improvement, why aren't we, why haven't we fully utilized this powerful educational uh, uh, tool in, uh, in surgery? And there are many reasons. One of them, as I talked a little bit before, is uh, related to the culture 
uh, and uh, uh, the fact that we turned the operating room into such a secretive environment where everything that step, uh, stays there, uh, whatever happens there, stays there. And the moment uh, we exit the operating room, we either forget or ignore or deny and, and just move on. Uh, and this shouldn't be like that. Another uh, uh, challenge with count practice is the way we perceive our performance. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that many of us, we are all uh, competitive people, uh, and the majority of surgeons are. Uh, we uh, uh, we don't have, we often don't have an accurate uh, accurate perception of of our performance, and we often think that uh, the way uh, that nobody could do this procedure better than we did, uh, or the way we do it. Uh, and uh, the reality is that there are often things that uh, could be done better and should be done uh, better. And uh, also, another thing is uh, that uh, we often uh, don't uh, use uh, 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 modern frameworks to evaluate performance uh, and uh, provide feedback on performance in a constructive uh, way to uh, uh, each other or to our trainees. We, you, we tend to either, uh, the, the feedback uh, tends to uh, uh, swing between uh, you did a great job and you suck, uh, which is very different very difficult to use in a, in a constructive way. So uh, we need to create a system where we, we provide detailed, constructive and meaningful and actionable feedback, uh, not only around our technical performance, but also in the way we communicate need uh, or, uh, 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 or practice uh, as a team in, uh, in the operating room. So uh, we felt that uh, with uh, high quality uh, data, uh, we can create a better system that could allow us to uh, enhance our decision-making skills that can help us improve our technical and non-technical performance. We can much better than understand uh, variability and when we understand variability and the sources for that variability, we can much better address it and hopefully reduce it. Uh, and if this is done uh, uh, well, we are confident that, uh, that uh, 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 this type of approach could eventually improve uh, both our educational but also patient uh, outcomes and reduce uh, healthcare costs. So this is the reason why we created this platform, the Operating Room Black Box. We, we introduced it first, the first generation here at St. Michael's in 2014, uh, and the initiative has been growing since then. Uh, it uh, basically combines large, amount, large amounts of uh, structured and unstructured data uh, and through a combination of, uh, of uh, uh, human and artificial intelligence, uh, we are able to generate a number of, uh, of reports that allow us to quantify uh, technical and non-technical performance. It allows us to identify uh, uh, safety threats and resilience supports. It allows us to, in a structured way, evaluate the value of surgical technology. Uh, and uh, a number of other uh, opportunities that uh, we can uh, uh, create uh, uh, through uh, uh, appropriate uh, use of uh, this information. So this for the first time gave us the opportunity to uh, acquire a holistic view of the operating room and look uh, for these hidden dependencies uh, between technical, non-technical performance, distractions, uh, device uh, performance and a number of other factors that uh, are quite fascinating uh, to study and see how they uh, interact. Uh, traditionally, we've looked at, uh, uh, of, uh, at technical skills as the only predictor of, uh, of clinical outcomes and the reality is that technical skill skills are impacted by so many uh, uh, other factors in a complex environment like, like, like the operating room and this allows us to study those. Uh, in order to process these large amounts of data, uh, we, we developed various uh, AI algorithms. One of the first ones that we developed and continue to refine uh, is the uh, algorithms that protect uh, privacy and confidentiality of, uh, of uh, healthcare providers and patients. Uh, and this is a, an algorithmic, mo algorithmic model that identifies uh, faces and blurs them. It cartoonifies bodies, it pitches voices, and eliminates all the information that uh, can indicate date, time, or patient name. Uh, 
We also uh, use uh, various algorithms that allow us to study uh, uh, team dynamics. So we know at any point uh, how many people were in the room, where they were positioned, how they were interacting with each other, uh, where, uh, uh, where um, uh, uh, the majority of the people uh, uh, are uh, at any point. Uh, it's been very useful for us uh, here recently when we were studying various uh, initiatives to improve or reduce risk uh, for uh, during the COVID pandemic uh, in the operating room uh, and a number of other uh, initiatives that, that where these algorithms are have proven to be very useful. Uh, we also, uh, since uh, the very early days, uh, we started acquiring a lot of data around, uh, as I mentioned before, the near miss or the intraoperative adverse event. The intraoperative adverse event are all these uh, events that uh, happen in the operating room as a result of our actions. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> in the majority of the cases, we identify them, we rectify them, and they have no impact on uh, the clinical outcome. But in some, in some instances, they are not identified, they are not rectified, and that could lead to post-operative clinical uh, uh, adverse outcome. Uh, so uh, we've developed various algorithms that identify bleeding, thermal injury, mechanical injury, and classifies them according to their severity. Uh, we also have been, uh, we've been working in the area of performance assessment for close to 20 years. Uh, and uh, now throughout the, uh, throughout the past uh, six years, we've been uh, developing various uh, 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 modern uh, 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 metrics for technical performance that are not based on uh, global rating scales, but they're, they're based on factors or, or metrics that are explainable, uh, that are actionable, and that are meaningful for uh, the individual who receives this information. This is uh, another initiative uh, where uh, uh, we, we've tried to develop uh, uh, various algorithms that quantify technical performance during open surgery. As uh, many of us know, open surgery has always been challenging to uh, uh, capture, uh, to analyze, uh, and this uh, uh, new uh, platform that we introduced not too long ago allows us to uh, uh, identify instruments, is, uh, uh, allows us to identify the surgical field, the hands of the, of the surgeon, and again, use m many of these parameters to quantify uh, performance. And, why, uh, why do we do that? Uh, we, uh, we measure performance because uh, all of us know that technical performance matters. Uh, there were, uh, after the initial Berkmar study, there were a number of studies. Uh, this uh, is one, uh, one of these studies that we did here uh, uh, that uh, uh, confirmed that technical performance is an independent predictor for, for post-operative uh, clinical outcomes, especially in uh, high-risk uh, technically challenging surgical procedures. We've proven that now for gastrectomy, for cystectomy, uh, a number of gyne gynecological procedures and so on. So we need to measure performance, we need to address insufficient performance, and we need to understand the factors that lead to variability in, in performance. Not, very, uh, not only variability between individuals, but in, in variability within the same individual, because that's uh, the technical performance is often influenced by uh, other factors in the operating room. What else have we learned uh, uh, throughout the years? Uh, as, it, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the major challenges is, uh, has been for us uh, working in the area of surgical education and uh, uh, quality improvement, the access to high quality data. This is, uh, this is the very first study uh, that we did uh, uh, when we introduced the black box. We looked at the first 50 procedures and we identified the, not an insignificant number of high severity intraoperative adverse events. We asked every single team member in the end of the procedure to tell us whether they felt that this procedure went perfect uh, or uh, that they identified any uh, adverse events. And in 75% of the cases where there were uh, uh, high severity intraoperative adverse events, the team felt at the end of the procedure that everything went perfect. So, uh, obviously, there is a significant amount of data that is lost that we shouldn't that we should be identifying, we should be studying, and we should be using to improve uh, education and quality. Another uh, significant challenge in uh, in uh, in our daily work is we often introduce uh, devices, new 
complex devices uh, in our practice, they are designed to make us safer and uh, more efficient, but often they introduce uh, uh, new risks, new challenges. Uh, they impact our performance, they impact uh, efficiency and flow uh, in the operating room. So we identify, we quantify uh, a number of uh, challenges with modern equipment uh, that, uh, again, we uh, currently don't capture device manufacturer don't get access to uh, detailed information like this. And, and, and it is something that uh, we should be uh, identifying and discussing with them in order to improve uh, uh, device performance, which is becoming a more and more challenging uh, uh, problem. Another issue in uh, our daily practice is uh, our, uh, the, the, the cultural aspects in the operating, the, the, our ability to uh, manage stress, uh, our ability to uh, create a, a friendly, collaborative, uh, supportive environment in the operating room, which will uh, eliminate stress, which will uh, uh, hopefully reduce uh, burnout uh, and will attract more and more people to our profession in the future. So we've shown here clearly that stress is, uh, 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 is not only uh, negatively impacts the well-being of uh, of our uh, in, uh, our operative teams, but also impacts uh, the quality of care, of care uh, and the safety and uh, and impacts the safety of our patients. So uh, it uh, it's another reminder that uh, we need to invest uh, in uh, in uh, or we need to make an effort. Uh, in the operating room to uh, to improve the culture, to improve the uh, the, envir the, the environment, and be more supportive and, and, and collaborative, because ultimately that will impact uh, uh, all of us. Uh, this is an example where we uh, compared uh, new technology. Our our hospital was considering 3D versus 2D uh, laparoscopic monitors. Obviously, 3D were more expensive, and we decided why don't we why don't we uh, evaluate ourselves rather than uh, rely on the marketing claims of the uh, of the device manufacturers. So we tested a number of uh, 25 procedures with a 2D and 25 procedures with a 3D technology, and we showed that actually 3D technologies uh, made us better. We reduced the number of errors, we reduced the number of adverse events, uh, we improved uh, the technical performance of uh, the uh, surgical team. There were a number of other limitations. Uh, but again, we were able to evaluate new technology in a structured and evidence-based uh, way and allowed us, that allowed us to make an informed decision about what we should be investing in and what we should be uh, passing on. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the topic of distractions in the operating room is something that's uh, been quite fascinating for me and uh, several members of our research group. Here we partnered with a team at uh, one of the hospitals uh, in the Greater Toronto area, where we looked at uh, 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 various distractions uh, during critical phases of surgery uh, across three professional groups, and it, one of the findings was that we understand very little uh, uh, about uh, what the critical steps are for a nursing team. The nursing team understands very little what the critical steps are for the surgical team, and by improving this understanding and common common awareness, we can actually improve our performance. This is an example uh, uh, where uh, we look at uh, the sources of distractions, whether surgeons and anesthesiologists, nurses, uh, PSAs, and so on. Uh, and uh, we looked at the various phases, and we we showed that we identified that during nurses' tasks, we as surgeons uh, distracted them significantly. During surgeons' tasks, nurses distracted us. And during anesthesiologist tasks, uh, which is the emergence or extubation, we both the nurses and the surgeons distracted them, uh, and we showed very little understanding that this was the mo one of the most critical steps for them. So, by creating this common awareness, uh, we uh, uh, we feel that we can create better environment, uh, better working environment in the operating room, and, and safer uh, environment in the operating room. Um, so uh, the the one of the studies that uh, we uh, conducted uh, during um, when we introduced uh, uh, the black box in our so in our OR is uh, we wanted to see whether uh, we could use this detailed performance analysis and feedback uh, to improve performance and reduce uh, uh, errors uh, in our uh, operating theaters. And this was at that point how uh, we communicated the information. I know it it looks a little busy, but 
uh, this uh, 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 the, the way we visualize data at that point uh, helped us understand the whole story of this procedure. We were able on one timeline uh, overlay uh, the non-technical performance uh, of the various professional group, the technical performance, the number of distractions, and then we're also able to capture uh, these red uh, uh, circles indicate various uh, uh, intraoperative adverse events, and the larger the circle, the, the more severe the uh, intraoperative adverse event. We also identified how those were rectified. Uh, so we were able then, and then we were able to see the various steps and sub-steps of the surgical procedure, and we did that for a number of surgical procedures. And then we used that uh, post-operatively, to, and it took us between uh, 10 and 20 minutes uh, to provide very structured, constructive feedback to the entire surgical team so that we all understand what we did right and what we did wrong, what were the, the critical steps, what were the, the adverse events, and how we identified them and rectified them as a team. Uh, we were, that was all supported with, uh, with video, with some detailed information about what happened, why it happened, uh, and uh, it also allowed us to identify not only the technical aspects of our performance, but also the non-technical aspects of our performance. So uh, it was very well received, uh, and uh, 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 it was uh, overall a very successful, feasible uh, experiment that uh, showed uh, uh, in a randomized uh, uh, trial significant impact of this uh, uh, video coaching. It, uh, it uh, showed us that uh, we can dramatically or significantly improve uh, the uh, performance of the surgical team, but we also were able to reduce the number of errors with uh, 50%. So with this type of uh, information with deep and detailed uh, uh, and highly reliable data, we can answer many questions that relate to uh, quality, safety, education, well-being, culture, uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, we uh, uh, now uh, uh, collaborate with a number of institutions around uh, Canada, US, and, uh, and Western Europe, uh, where uh, all of them uh, who participate in this initiative have access to the uh, aggregate database and answer whatever questions are relevant for their um, uh, clinical environment. So to summarize, uh, I think all of us, uh, now uh, uh, should agree that uh, assessment uh, and uh, critical reflection uh, uh, after each uh, 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 procedure in the operating room are, 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 are critical if we want to improve. Uh, I think it is important to uh, change uh, the culture in the operating room in, and introduce openness, transparency, accountability, collaboration. We, uh, uh, it, it is critical uh, for any high performance uh, organization to create uh, a culture where uh, error uh, is tolerated, uh, is recognized, is studied in deep detail, uh, and learn from, uh, from these errors, and also learn from our successes. One of the, the, the key experiences for us has been that uh, instead of always being, uh, 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 when we talk about safety, quality and safety, always be uh, obsessed with failure and focus on adverse outcomes uh, and mobility and mortality, we should also be able to quantify success, resilience supports, things that we do extremely well and despite uh, failure and malfunction and variability still allow us to achieve good clinical outcomes for our patients. Uh, we also feel that a lot of the, the, the uh, uh, operational decisions uh, are currently based on gut feeling or, uh, or uh, a bunch of people sitting around the table and making uh, 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 the decision based on their experience. And we feel that uh, the data is so dynamic, things that happen in the operating room with new technologies, uh, with new uh, individuals, with new devices uh, are so dynamic that we need to make these decisions data uh, driven. And uh, finally, uh, one of the most important thing is that uh, improving uh, performance, uh, improving safety uh, would never be possible without uh, changing the culture in, in, uh, in our operating room. Technology can play a role, uh, but uh, fundamentally, uh, 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 the uh, 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 
collaborative, supportive uh, culture and, uh, and uh, uh, being ready for open, transparent and accountable approach uh, is uh, the, of uh, uh, fundamental importance. So I'll stop here uh, with final image of downtown Toronto and uh, in our hospital. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether there will be an opportunity to, to ask questions, but happy to, uh, to answer the questions if there. Thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, Theodore, for, for an outstanding presentation. It's really exciting to see where this is, is going. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. I, I'll just maybe open up with one question specifically, which is uh, probably on the minds of many of us, which is with this new exciting technology and the opportunity to really dissect uh, the cause of error and even find strategies for uh, training and uh, uh, team dynamics, um, have there been cases thus far of medical legal implications with with the system? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, we uh, we uh, uh, worked very closely with. There is some echo. Uh, so anyway, we we worked very closely with the the uh, uh, in in Canada. There is one. Uh, uh, um, uh, organization that protects uh, all uh, physicians cost to cost against malpractice. We worked in the first year very closely with them uh, to create an environment that uh, that uh, uh, allows us to use uh, this technology for constructive purposes and uh, and uh, eliminates the risk for using it to fuel malpractice litigation. So there are a number of uh, protective mechanisms. Uh, one of the, the first one is obviously uh, we were uh, obsessed with protecting uh, privacy and confidentiality of uh, both uh, healthcare providers and patients. Uh, so the, the, al there are ir irreversible algorithms that uh, uh, de-identify uh, by design uh, everybody in, uh, in the room. Second, uh, all raw video and audio data is uh, uh, is studied. All the data features are extracted so that they can be used for quality improvement. But the raw video and audio uh, information is destroyed at uh, 30 days. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we, as I said, we've been we've used this for uh, for uh, six uh, year, a little more than six years here at St. Michael's. Uh, and a bunch of other hospitals uh, in uh, uh, currently 12 hospitals in uh, uh, Canada, US, and uh, Western Europe. There hasn't been a case uh, uh, where this information has been requested for uh, any malpractice litigation. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, it's uh, in a, when we first launched it here, my wait times as a surgeon doubled and tripled because many patients felt that. Uh, uh, these were characteristics that they wanted to see uh, in their healthcare provider: openness, transparency, accountability, uh, ability to uh, learn from error and make sure they don't are not repeated. So, uh, so we've had a we've seen a tremendous support from patients. Uh, we have been the most bringing from a philanthropic point of view research group uh, in our hospital for the past uh, four or five years. Uh, because uh, patients uh, and society uh, is hungry for initiative like this. So, uh, it's, uh, so we've done everything uh, to eliminate the risk for using the data for destructive purposes. And uh, we uh, have uh, seen uh, so far only support and nothing uh, and, and haven't observed any, any negative uh, uh, impact of this initiative. And finally, I think uh, there is, it is clearly something that uh, uh, our patients are uh, hungry for, information, uh, quality improvement initiatives, uh, and true quality improvement initiatives like this one. Uh, I think uh, we have a small window as a, as, as, as a profession to introduce some of these measures. Uh, if we don't do it, 
uh, there will be uh, uh, decisions, either political or administrative decisions, that will impose uh, practices like that. We've seen already uh, some efforts in uh, Wisconsin and other states. So I feel that uh, uh, we have a chance to do this right, to uh, uh, create uh, data and turn it into information uh, that is meaningful to us as a profession and makes us better. Now, this is uh, uh, Doug Wood, Dr. Grentroff. Uh, this is terrific and exciting to see. I'm going to read a uh, question from Dr. Pellegrini uh, that's a, a practical question. Then I have a question to follow that. Uh, so Dr. Pellegrini is asking, how many hospitals in Canada are using this technology? And what are the steps that a hospital would take to acquire and use uh, the technology you've been describing? Uh, in in uh, in Canada, uh, I think at this point we have uh, six uh, hospitals uh, uh, using the technology. Uh, we're adding two more uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, in the U.S., the technology is currently installed in three major uh, academic centers, and we're adding uh, three more within the next three months. Uh, in Western Europe. Uh, it's currently used in four major uh, academic centers. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the technology is fairly uh, easy to uh, install and uh, acquire and install. Uh, and uh, as I said before, uh, every institution at this point uh, that participates in this uh, has access to not only their own data, obviously that's their, that they own their own data, uh, but uh, we have created a collaborative uh, group of, uh, of uh, institutions, researchers that uh, have access to, to the aggregate uh, database to answer exciting questions uh, and, uh, and use it for various research initiatives. And uh, we've been uh, uh, quite successful uh, with acquiring grants, uh, large uh, multi-institutional research grants that support uh, some of this work. I'm going to read the other questions as well because they're better than mine. Um, uh, I'll have a question from uh, Dr. Flum who asked to describe some of the unstructured data that's used in the black box and what kind of insights you're getting from that. Well, the unstructured data is uh, video and audio data. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, which is nothing new, we've been capturing video in the operating room for a very long time. Uh, the challenge has always been to turn this video uh, into some, uh, some uh, structured data insights, whether that's uh, performance, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's technical, non-technical performance, or some other infectious risks. Uh, we've uh, recently in, in, included analytics around around to use the PPE and so on. So these are all, we turned this on structured data, which is video into structured data insights that answer specific questions. Uh, another source of unstructured data is audio. So we use uh, audio to, uh, uh, to train algorithms that can quantify, uh, an example is the surgical safety checklist. So traditionally, uh, I don't know how it is at uh, your hospital, at our hospital, I, I, I get the, uh, the analytics uh, at the end of each month and I always see 99.7 compliance with the surgical safety checklist. When we look at our data, we, we break this down with our data into three components. One is compliance, was it done uh, at when it's supposed to be done? Second is engagement. Was it done by the surgical resident where the nurse was counting instruments and the anesthetist was uh, 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 looking at their, uh, uh, or uh, drawing their trucks? Uh, uh, it's uh, obviously the, the engagement was suboptimal and uh, it is uh, the, 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 the value, uh, the true value of the checklist can only be achieved if, uh, if this is done by engaging the entire team. And the third is the quality where all the, all the questions, all the components of the checklist addressed. So, so again, uh, and then once we looked at the data that way, we show, we saw so many things that we should have, uh, we could do better compared to the traditional 
check uh, that uh, usually the nurse does in uh, in Epic or whatever uh, 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 health record there is there. So so uh, again, that was uh, that's an example where we turn unstructured data into some structured insights. So the questions are coming in hot and fast now. They're and they're good ones. Um, um, uh, next question is, have you used the product as a proctoring tool to evaluate, mentor, and coach new faculty? Uh, so uh, we uh, have created uh, a platform, we've created analytics or the report that could be used. Uh, this hasn't been done yet. So uh, we, uh, um, again, this, uh, we're, we've got a few initiatives that we currently run. Uh, the, uh, the coaching is uh, some of the uh, new hospitals coming uh, on board are going to be using that for coaching. We, we've we used it only in the randomized trial. We showed that it works, uh, but we haven't uh, operationalized it yet. But others uh, uh, are doing this later this year. Uh, the next one is uh, from Andy Wright, who uh, uh, says how great it is to see you in the progress of your group. Um, and he says the, the work is focused on feedback and then makes an analogy. He says his relatively inexpensive Subaru has technology that can automatically recognize a near accident and apply the brakes. Could the black box technology be used to automatically recognize and prevent injury? Uh, we believe that that will be a reality in five to 10 years. Uh, that uh, obviously uh, we we can see a lot of the analogies uh, uh, between uh, self-driving cars and uh, and uh, uh, the ability to improve uh, uh, road safety with that. Uh, we we feel that uh, that's a fairly uh, long process. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, obstacles there. One is we need way more data to train uh, effective algorithms. Two is still computational power is at, at the edge at in the in the OR is a challenge. Uh, it is still fairly expensive, but uh, I believe that in five to ten years that will change. Uh, uh, however, we have uh, we are going to very soon start launching some similar initiatives, uh, mainly related to distractions. Uh, we uh, where we will be able to provide. Um, feedback in real time uh, to the entire team uh, because uh, we've got the very effective algorithms that can break a, that can break a procedure into steps and, and sub steps we can predefine which are the critical steps in a surgical procedure uh, and uh, uh, and then we can bring common awareness that now we're entering a critical step uh, and there should be no changeover of nursing staff there should be no uh, phones or pagers and there shouldn't be a, a uh, the front desk uh, clerk coming into the OR asking where, when we will be done. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, 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 we can, and I feel that uh, with that, we can make uh, a very significant impact in a, in a fairly low tech way uh, and uh, something that we can see some results uh, in terms of real time decision support uh, fairly soon, probably sometime next year. But great question from Andy. Yeah, of course. It, there's always a good question from Andy. Um, uh, next one is, anyone using this in a, a simulated environment? <laughs> That's a great question. Actually, we are just installing it uh, today in, our, in two simulation centers here in Toronto. Uh, and uh, one of the centers, uh, here, one of the downtown uh, hospitals uh, uh, in Toronto uh, is launching an initiative uh, later this year, where they will be using uh, some of the data to uh, to power their simulation efforts. Uh, this is something I've I've worked in the area of simulation for more than twenty years, uh, and one of the things that have always bothered me is that we base simulation into one size fits all. We develop a simulation curriculum, uh, and we deliver it to everybody, and we assume that my educational needs are very similar to the to the educational needs of my colleagues at, in uh, U Washington, and that's not the case. Uh, the the patterns, the performance patterns in a in a OR at St. Michael's are very different than the performance patterns uh, in an OR it's in Seattle. 
So by identifying what, uh, where, what we uh, don't do so well in the operating room, uh, we can design deliberate practice simulation initiatives to address this deficiency in a very individualized, targeted fashion. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, shift this uh, uh, approach in simulation from one size fits all to targeted, individualized, deliberate practice. So I feel that uh, that uh, linking OR performance and uh, uh, and simulation uh, activities on, or simulation solutions uh, will help us to truly achieve uh, the promise of simulation, which I feel we haven't really achieved. The next question is about grant funding and you know, asking the question, what, what are your funding agencies and, and do you know whether the NIH has similar support for this type of technology? Uh, so uh, I'm sure that uh, there, there, will be, there are many uh, funding agencies uh, in the US, uh, whether they're related to patient safety uh, whether they're related to uh, uh, patient advocacy. Uh, there are various agencies. I, 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 I uh, am sure that if the, if, if the initiative is proper, if it's properly uh, defined, uh, NIH could be another source. Uh, we have uh, throughout the years uh, uh, acquired more than $25 million uh, of research funding from federal, provincial, or other uh, uh, granting agencies. Uh, so uh, uh, our, our research institute uh, uh, has, uh, is, uh, we're, we're currently applying for a, a very large, uh, uh, tens of million dollars of, uh, of, uh, of a grant that will allow us to bring together various collaborative uh, uh, teams from ethics, law, uh, privacy, uh, performance, um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, data science, and so on. So, uh, and again, we're we're bringing a, a large multidisciplinary team, not only from Canada, but the various uh, established academic institutions in uh, the U.S. and Europe. Uh, and I think if we continue to show success, if we continue to show impact on something that matters, uh, uh, which is patient safety, cost reduction. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, we will continue to be able to attract the research funding. So that's a good segue to the next a good question. This one from Dr. Olschlager, who um, is connecting to your analogy to professional sports. So his point is, like many things in professional life, actions are driven by economics. Federer uses coaching and simulation because performance is clearly tied to success. And that's true for airlines as well. The processes you describe are expensive, especially in terms of human capital. Perhaps that might be easier in Canada, but have you thought of ways to convince United States health systems to use this technology? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, uh, th that's fundamentally, this is the question about the return on investment. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's uh, uh, we as professional surgeons or uh, nurses, anesthesiologists, people working every day in the operating room need to convince uh, our CFO or uh, the administration that this actually matters. And uh, we, I remember in the early days when I was the director of the simulation center here, uh, it was always, uh, we, we always failed to uh, uh, define the return on investment or, or support that with, uh, with good data. And it, and it always, it, it always felt like charity. They gave us a check at the end of the fiscal year if there was something left. Uh, well, we changed this approach now. So uh, we now provide uh, uh, a lot of detailed data to our hospital around uh, uh, compliance, about efficiency, uh, about uh, uh, we, a lot of the, uh, when we acquire new technology or new devices, we evaluate them using this approach and we, we, we help them uh, with data to make uh, better decisions. So one, one single, uh, one, one single uh, example is uh, last week, uh, we did some, some data 
uh, analysis around uh, because our algorithms identify instruments so they can tell you for this procedure what kind of instrument you used at what time, how many times, and so on. So we looked at our laparoscopic surgical trace, uh, and uh, we showed that uh, for certain procedure, uh, we had way more instruments that we actually use. So we, we showed a number of instruments that we never use. So now we had to uh, acquire, we have to renew our laparoscopic trace. We, with the data that we generated, we, we purchased 44% less instruments. And this was a millions of dollars of, of bill. We also showed that uh, uh, we don't need to manually clean these instruments. We don't need to store them. We don't need to assemble them. And that also translated to significant uh, cost reduction. So we've tried along the way uh, to provide some very clear uh, data not only on the quality of performance, not only the quality of training, uh, uh, and a, a lot of other things that are hard to measure uh, with uh, financial terms, which is satisfaction, attitude to safety, teamwork, communication, collaboration, and so on, burnout, ch uh, uh, change, turnover of staff, and so on. But we've also been able to show very clear benefits in terms of reducing idle time, improving efficiency, uh, st uh, standardizing uh, instrumentation, and this is something that our hospital was, has been able to see on their PNL statement. Uh, and this is now not anymore uh, a charity, uh, but this is a very clearly well-designed uh, uh, business proposal that also not only improves uh, uh, the quality of our work, but also uh, reduces some cost, which which is very important in the current environment. So. Uh, I think it is possible uh, to uh, to uh, show return on investment. We've we've done it, and we do it with everything now. Uh, we have included a health economist and a line of research in health economics, uh, because uh, it uh, it will be more and more challenging to acquire hospital institutional funding without uh, clear data on the return on investment. So I um, I completely agree that this is uh, uh, something that we need to get used to uh, with any type of research. Um, the next question is about uh, integrating the technology with video feeds from robotic surgery and uh, that you would get a number of additional data streams if, and metrics from this, but there might be logistical barriers given the propriety nature of the robotic technology. So how is this linking with robotic surgery? Uh, we're, we just outfitted uh, all the robotic rooms and uh, at uh, uh, one of the major institutions in Texas, uh, and uh, we uh, we created various integrations. We we it's true we don't acquire proprietary data that uh, the robot generates, but we can turn a, a lot of uh, we can we can turn the video capture from the robotic surgery into data. Uh, that for us is uh, is uh, is uh, meaningful, actionable, and uh, and relevant. So uh, we 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 can provide uh, value uh, and uh, opportunities to improve quality, safety, and efficiency during robotic surgery. Uh, Intuitive is one of the the device manufacturers that we haven't approached yet, uh, but. Uh, in the majority of the cases, many of the device manufacturers allow us to extract software data from their devices uh, because ultimately we have the same goal. That, that we want to make their devices safer uh, and they want their devices to be safer. So without this type of information, without the clinical context, they wouldn't be able to, to achieve that. So um, uh, there are no obstacles uh, in uh, uh, capturing robotic uh, data. Uh, I believe that sometime in the near future, we will be able to acquire uh, the raw data that the robot uh, uh, generates. Uh, however, that's not critical for the success of this initiative. So we're, we're close to out of time. So I'm gonna to go to just one more question, although there are other good questions, but uh, I think this is a great one to end on. This comes from Dr. Kim, who is on our faculty and is our own expert on uh, team dynamics and communication. And uh, she's asking the question about, uh, can you comment about 
specific aspects of team communication dynamics that you've analyzed and missed opportunities to speak up? Uh, so uh, there, there, there are various uh, uh, frameworks, there are various approaches, and we work with a number of, uh, uh, with, with a number of uh, scientists uh, in, uh, in this area. So we quantify, uh, obviously we quantify uh, team performance uh, using some of the established uh, frameworks, uh, but we also work with various uh, 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 scientists that uh, identify other areas of team performance. For example, uh, team performance during uh, phases of uncertainty, uh, 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 a, a team performance uh, related to other uh, uh, aspects. Uh, some uh, we've we've done we've done a lot of work, and there is a lot, and there is a, a research group in Ottawa working on uh, uh, the impact of gender uh, uh, and uh, and how that uh, impacts the team dynamics and team performance. Uh, so. Uh, we we haven't really addressed the question of uh, uh, opportunity to speak up, uh, which is clearly related to the uh, the safety culture in that in that institution. It is it, of crucial importance. Uh, we 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 capture some information that could be used to answer some questions uh, around that specific uh, uh, idea. Uh, we'd love to. Uh, connect with Dr. Kim and hopefully find a way to collaborate either through the, the data that we currently have uh, acquired or maybe an opportunity to uh, uh, develop uh, new metrics or new measures of, uh, 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 or new measurements of, uh, of, uh, uh, of team performance. So, uh, uh, but one thing is sure that team performance is one of the most critical aspects of intraoperative performance and uh, we've uh, we currently have incorporated in our analysis the established uh, metrics, but we're always looking for new metrics and new opportunities to, uh, to uh, enhance uh, non-technical skills on a team level. Well, that's, uh, those are terrific answers. I'm, I'm glad that we had a chance to go through uh, most of the questions because as you could see, uh, people warmed up once we got started and had a lot of uh, challenging questions for you. Um, this is you know, a truly exciting work and we're so pleased that you took the time today to present this to us. We're sorry that you're not here also, but we'll welcome you to Seattle uh, anytime once we can all travel again or once you take down the border wall between uh, Canada and the United States. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for a really a, a inspiring and innovative presentation and for uh, all the work that you're doing. Uh, it's, it's exciting. I'm sure it's going to create a lot of discussion amongst uh, our faculty, residents, and staff here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a great day.